The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a conversation with Alex Malpass. So Alex and I met uh, online and we've had a number of different interactions, a few group hangouts and things like that. I've referenced him several times in videos. And when I started the Atheist Debates Project, the goal was to take a look at the arguments, to talk about the different forms that those arguments might take, so that if you hear something like, look at the trees, you understand, hey, this is talking about, you know, the teleological arguments, um, perhaps the anthropic principle, things like that. And it allows you to direct unusual versions of a particular apologetic to something that you're more familiar with. I also wanted to post the debates that I had, reviews of those debates. And while it might be nice for me to be the ultimate arbiter of what should or shouldn't be said in a debate, uh, I don't actually think that's true. And there are a lot of great thinkers out there and I need to be uh, corrected and educated as well. And I like the fact that we can uh, have edifying discussions that I benefit from, that other people might benefit from because I'm not always gonna be right. And on that front, I've decided uh, to sit down and have a conversation with Alex. And this is our first kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion. We're probably going to focus primarily on presuppositionalist apologetics because we both had some interesting interactions in that front over the last year or two. And But I also want to see if we can continue this um, because there's probably areas where we don't agree and I may well be wrong. Matter of fact, I probably am wrong. Uh, but for today, we're gonna we're gonna focus on this, and we'll see what happens afterwards. Alex, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Uh, why don't we start by having you give uh, kind of your background expertise, uh, just in general? Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, I've got some. I've got. PhD in philosophy um, and a master's degree in undergraduate in philosophy too. So I spent the uh, best part of 10 years at university doing that. And then I, I hung around for a few years afterwards teaching. Did some, so I was a lecturer for a few years as well. Um, I, I, I don't teach philosophy for a living anymore. Now I work in higher education policy. But um, I think I'm by inclination the type of person that is is a philosopher i always think about you know weird philosophical conundrums throughout the day <laughs> when i'm doing stuff anyway so uh, my mind always keeps ticking over and i think since um i've not been paid to do philosophy my interests have changed somewhat in in the things that i think about so um my sort of area of focus when i was a, a philosopher was in um kind of metaphysics and, and logic in particular area uh, of that. Um, and after a while, that, um, when, when you've been doing this very specific sort of nuanced area for a very long time, and then you stop doing that and your mind is free to focus on whatever it wants to, often it wanders to things that are completely unrelated. And so for some reason, I found myself um, thinking about religion, philosophy of religion, I suppose. Um, and then I found my way somehow to presuppositional apologetics. Um, I think I watched a video with Cy Ten talking to this guy Alex Botton. I don't know if you've come across him, but he had a program uh, called Fundamentally I'm, Flawed. Yeah, I'm familiar with him. I, I, I don't think we've ever interacted. And if I recall correctly, um, I had a number of objections to his positions as well. <laughs> well, I, yeah. So, they, but they had a very heated, maybe maybe series of discussions on on the precept. Uh, and then, and I can remember thinking like how I'd never heard that type of argument before. You know, in all my years of philosophy, I'd never heard anyone doing pre the presuppositional argument because you come across the standard sort of classical arguments, you know, ontological argument, cosmological argument, right. those types of things. Um, and yet, presuppositional was, was kind of new. It was weird, um, and I, it was it's like the first time you hear the ontological argument where you think like there must be something that's going on here that's, that's wrong. It's some, somewhere there's a sleight of hand or something that's in the background. It's really hard to see what, what that is straight away. And then actually once you start focusing in on it, um, in order to kind of uncover that sleight of hand, you, you realise that there's lots of interesting overlapping philosophical concepts that are going on there. So, so for clarity, just because I don't want to lose anybody else, uh, yeah. if 
might be good to talk a little bit about what you mean by focusing on the metaphysical previous to this. And then we should probably give some sort of description of presuppositionalist apologetics. Um, I don't know that we need to go through all of the categories, the, the classical categories for your arguments for the existence of God, but we're distinguishing the ones that are often viewed as evidentialist, where we're, we've got some, um, where, where our premises are tied to empirical observations uh, and maybe presuppositionalist presuppositionalism steps outside of that. So if you, if you want to kind of go through the metaphysical and then move us on. Yeah. So, I mean, the way I see it, that there's, there's really three types of apologetical arguments. Um, so then the first type is, is kind of classical um, arguments and they are, um, well, they're a priori arguments. So they're arguments that are supposed to be independent of any particular piece of experience that you have. They're, they're reasoning, um, this type of reasoning that you could do on, in an armchair, um, purely in, in your mind. You're supposed to be able to reason from first principles through nothing but pure application of logic to the conclusion that God exists. So the ontological argument is of that category. They say something like God is the necessarily greatest thing that there could be and the necessarily greatest thing that there could be must exist or it would be lacking in some way. Therefore, that thing exists. Let's call that thing God, right? That argument doesn't rely on you having any particular observation. So it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be an a priori argument. On the other hand, there are then evidential arguments, which are like um, set maybe the argument from design or something, which is taking this kind of observation of a particular thing, this feature of the eye, this complexity of the wing or something like that, and then using that, having a, an argument that starts from that. So I'd classify that as an evidential argument. Um, and then there's a third category, which is a presuppositional argument, which is like, well, it's contentious what it is. I mean, I, I personally find I change my mind on this subject quite often, but it's something along the lines of saying that the very notion of argument itself presupposes that God exists. And therefore, you couldn't have an argument that goes in the opposite direction. And that's not quite an a priori argument, but it's certainly not an evidential argument. It's supposed to be any a priori argument has this as its foundation, without which it would be impossible. So it's supposed to be one step more abstract than an a priori argument, the transcendental presuppositional argument. Um, yeah. so, so in a, in a sense, it's this third category. So the presuppositionalists, and, and we'll talk about kind of some differences between the people who are, are making use of this and who understands what. Now, you've made a distinction between a priori and a posteriori. Uh, but also there's the analytic synthetic distinction where, you know, analytic ideas are true by virtue of their meaning, which would, um, I, I tend to kind of look at analytic synthetic as a, a priori and a posteriori. There's a similarity there, but they're not necessarily identical, correct? Yeah, well, I mean, so, so the, the idea was they were commonly associated, like, like as you just did up until Kant, more or less. So Kant's big kind of, well, I mean, this is simplifying, obviously. Kant's incredibly complicated, but to simplify it a lot, to make it straightforward, Kant's idea was that, um, so up until Kant, the idea was that you couldn't have um, an a priori. So a priori is a, is a type of knowledge, something that you can know without looking at the world. A mm -hmm. posteriori is a type of knowledge that you can only have in virtue of having observed something. So the idea was that you couldn't, and, and analytic means true in virtue of the meanings of the terms. Like a definition, like we're just going to say, you know, a, a square has four sides that are all of equal length. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So um, there's different ways of cashing out exactly what um, what that means, but but broadly speaking, it's it's like that in virtue of its meaning. And then a synthetic truth is one that's essentially just not true in virtue of its meaning. It's true in virtue of some other fact, like a substantial fact about the way that the world is, rather than just a relation of of ideas together, like a definition is. Um, so we've got these kind of four different categories. Um, and yeah, normally you'd think um, all of the a priori, anything that I can know without looking at the world, would really just be a thing about definitions. I mean, it, right, so that's, that's the idea. You can deduce the properties of a, of a, a, a square, say, um, by just defining what you mean by square and then seeing what follows from that, right? But you couldn't actually know that anything that was square existed, like a synthetic truth without having some a posteriori knowledge, actually observing the world and seeing if there is a square thing that actually exists. So that, so the idea is quite natural that you would, you'd have these two things, analytic and a priori, 
a posteriori and synthetic. They kind of go naturally together, as you suggested, right? Yeah, and I remember, and I'm sure we'll get into a little bit about certainty later on because that's one of my my big things. I, I have this idea that the sticking point for presuppositionalists in particular is this unflinching desire for absolute certainty. And when I yeah. used to have discussions about absolute certainty, I, I have changed my mind um, significantly over the past probably five or six years because I used to say that you can't be absolutely certain about anything except the, the logical absolutes and things that are derived from them or esoteric things like labels and definitions. Like I could be absolutely certain that a square has four, four sides that are of equal length. The problem that I discovered, which wasn't new to anybody but me probably, uh, was that in much the same way that I, I believe when um, when Descartes did the Cogitor Grissom, I think it was Hobbes that pointed out that you still can't be absolutely certain because this is all contingent on the primacy of reason. And so you can't have, if, if you can't be absolutely certain about the foundations of reason, then you can't be more confident, your confidence level in what is derived from that cannot be greater. So if you can't get to absolute certainty on reason as the foundation, then you can't have absolute certainty even that you exist or that, you know, your definitions of squares. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that's the best way to describe it, but currently my my view is that I don't see any pathway to absolute certainty on anything. Um, so maybe there's something to correct there, but I, I don't want to, you know, get too far afield from the precept stuff for now. Well, I mean, so it depends. I mean, these, these terms are thrown around often without any even attempt at, at, um, at fleshing them out in any way, which in, in philosophy, you don't just introduce a term that's crucial to a, an argument or piece of dialogue or something without um, being able to at least, if, if asked, be able to like flesh out what that term means, like giving in the necessary and sufficient conditions for that term. So you'd be able to you'd be able to rephrase it in such a way that was equivalent if somebody didn't know what you meant by it. And with certainty, I think that that needs to be done because, I mean, well, what, there's what there's one sense in which certainty is just an inner feeling. It's just you know, I it's a report. It's like being hungry or something. I feel certain that such and such. It doesn't mean anything about whether or not that's true. It what it is is a report about me. So when I say I'm certain that it's half past four or something. It doesn't mean that the fact that it's half past four has any particular property. I'm not talking about the fact. I'm talking about me, my attitude towards the fact. So a feeling of certainty is, is, um, is cheap. It's easy to have, and it doesn't really tell you very much apart from what you think. So when people say, when presuppositionists in particular say um, certainty in this context, what they mean is that they have an attitude towards a proposition that they believe the proposition, but that there's some kind of um, guarantee that means that their belief attitude towards that proposition couldn't be like incorrect. They couldn't be holding the wrong attitude towards that proposition. And there's some, that, that's what they mean by certainty is there's this kind of necess necessity between their, their belief and the, the proposition being true. And I think that's what you're gesturing towards, right? That, that yeah, you can't really have that. On Twitter yesterday, where somebody was asking me, you know, hey, when you say you can't or nobody could be absolutely certain, are you saying that they couldn't express a confidence level this way, or that they shouldn't express a confidence level this way, or are you talking about actual, you know, uh, knowledge? And what I'm, I think anybody can say, oh, I'm absolutely certain, but that's their reported confidence level, which may or may not match up with their actual confidence level. It could be, a, you know, an exercise in hyperbole. But it may be that they think that they have uh, some warrant, some guarantor of, uh, of a foundation that they could not possibly be wrong. And I think this is what some of the presuppositionalists are doing. But this, your self-reported confidence level or even what you are convinced your confidence level of is, is a separate issue from whether or not um, actual certainty, actual 100% confidence is could ever be warranted or is ever attainable. I think this is kind of the distinction. Yeah, well, and so when people talk about knowing something as opposed to believing it, 
like so so I could believe something um it, it it seems like I could believe something kind of just for no reason I could just I could just have this belief that the p is true um for for that belief to count as knowledge there has to be some extra additional facts about that um exactly what the conditions are for it to be knowledge rather than just a belief is contentious right the traditional model from Plato up until like 1967 or whenever it was was the that knowledge was a a justified true belief right then Edmund Gettier pu published this like two and a half page paper in a Brazilian journal <laughs> which somehow got picked up and reprinted again in English and utterly destroyed uh, like 2,000 years worth of epistemology um, and but what he did was showed that there are cases of um, justified true beliefs that don't count as knowledge um, so every all epistemology had this kind of massive revolution since then and it's it's in a state of flux now where the, the definition, even the very concept, is kind of under question. Um, but still, there's there's kind of general agreement that knowledge, for whatever it means, uh, means something stronger than than just having belief, better than mere belief. Um, it's kind of minimal condition would be that there's some something called a justification that you'd have for that belief. So you can't just believe something for no reason if it's going to count as knowledge. Now, the question is what type of thing can be can a justification be um traditional way of thinking about it is that justification for a belief would be a different belief so i believe that it's half past four now because i believe that it's 10 minutes after we started talking which was 20 past four or something you know that belief justifies my subsequent belief and you think that every belief that you have kind of pre like um has as its justification a different belief and that belief has as its justification a different belief and it keeps going backwards until we arrive either at some kind of foundational belief that we believe which uh, doesn't have a separate justificatory belief which is basically foundationalism or the chain of belief keeps ever and doesn't terminate or at some point there's some kind of i believe p because i believe q and i believe q because i believe p and there's this little circle that supports itself it seems to be yeah. that those this is the traditional way of thinking about if beliefs if justifications are beliefs then you are led into this kind of trilemma that it has to be one of those three types of situations and um, i mean the reasoning would normally be that the never-ending chain is basically the same as having no real justification because there's um you there wouldn't be any kind of ultimate starting point that the whole thing rests on at least that's that you could run that kind of objection and then the circularity thing just seems like um it's kind of a similar worry that it's there's it, there's nothing really holding the house up and right so if you think along these lines then you'd want to have some kind of foundational belief and this is this is where when you were talking about descartes before he wanted to find a secure proposition which was self-evidently true upon which he could rest all of the rest of his beliefs in this kind of foundational manner mm -hmm. um Okay, so that's that's that project, and if you could find this belief, which was self-evident, such a just by thinking about it, you knew that it was true, right? Then you could uh, everything that you could deduce from that, everything that followed from that, would have just as much certainty as the the, the foundational starting point. Right, um, but couldn't ever have more. You couldn't have more. No, no. But if it's self-evidently true, then that's that's as good as it can possibly be. Right? It's like yeah, it guarantees your belief lining up with the truth of the proposition so one of the things that i've dealt with is i have my particular usages for the the terms belief and knowledge which don't necessarily relate to the foundations of epistemology because what i found is um i'm not convinced that I, so when it comes to epistemology i i've said before that i'm kind of on board with susan hawk and coherentism or sorry, found here. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the combination of it. Uh, but I get it that, you know, you can have a big, long discussion about what is truth. Is there anything true? Um, I'm on board with presupposing what Matt Slick would call the logical absolutes, but are really, that's a terrible name for them. Uh, because to me, you know, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. Um, they seem to be self-evidently true. They seem, I don't find any way that you could get around the possibility of them being true. You would have to assume them in order to try to disprove them. And I think that they're, 
that there's a clear, obvious representation and like a single Venn diagram with a single circle explains all three of them. And this seems like it's, uh, I don't know if indefeasible is the right word, but it could be. But when I talk about belief and knowledge, I've repeatedly pointed out that, you know, that knowledge and seeking knowledge from, from the standpoint of epistemology, getting a firm foundation, incredibly interesting and would be in, incredibly useful as well. But what people talk about when they say, I know something from my experience is almost always just an expression of confidence in a belief that basically when they say, I know something, they're saying, I believe this and I really, 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 really believe it. And so I came up with, and I won't claim this as original, this is just my formation of it, that uh, belief, as I use the term, is the acceptance of a proposition as likely true or true. And that knowledge is a belief held to such a high confidence level that it would be worldview altering to discover that it was wrong. And I think that these kind of approach how colloquially people use the terms. They're, they're not, I have not constructed an epistemology. I'm just talking about the way people use the terms. And so when somebody says, I know something, I don't care about their confidence level. The mere fact that they believe it is sufficient to warrant me caring about it because we don't wait until we have knowledge. We don't wait until we have certainty. We don't wait until we have a high confidence level. We act in accordance with our beliefs. If I believe something is true, but I just barely believe it versus really strongly believe it, there's a distinction there, but I'm still going to act in accordance with my beliefs, whether I think I know it or not. Yeah, right. So, I mean, the, the, the notion of belief itself is one of these things that isn't as black and white as, as this, even this discussion up until now seems to portray as a black and white thing that I have a belief, I, I don't have a belief, but like it's standing in the attitude of holding that a proposition is true to believe it or something. But uh, epistemologists these days talk about degrees of belief. So um, you can quantify a degree of belief that you have in a proposition. Um, and the, the methodology that's used, I don't know if you know this, but maybe you do, but the, um, the way that philosophers talk about this now is that your degree of belief is quantified in the, the bets that you'd be willing to take on the proposition being true. So um, if you would, so it's all to do with the odds that you'd be happy to take. If you'd be willing to take a bet with very long odds, that means that you um, are, are very confident in the proposition being true. Whereas if you'd only accept very short odds, that means that you've got a very low level of confidence in it, right? So if, I don't know, I mean, if I told you um, that I've got a cup of, there's tea in this mug rather than coffee, right? you don't know which one, which way around it is. You've got no reason to think that it's tea rather than coffee. You would probably take a 50-50 bet, but you wouldn't bet your house on it being tea rather than coffee, obviously. And we'd probably find if I incrementally asked you whether you'd take a stronger and stronger bet, that there'd be the certain point where you'd say, no, I'm not going to take that bet. And then we could mathematically work out what the ratio is. And that's your degree of belief in the cup of tea, the cup having tea in it rather than coffee. So you yeah. can quantify out in, in a numeric term. And then there's this question of like, well, so maybe if you had a 0.6 degree of belief in it being tea rather than coffee, you sort of somewhat have a belief more that being tea than, than not being tea. Um, does that mean, does that warrant you being able to say, I believe that there's tea in the coffee, the tea in the mug, or should you still withhold, like, uh, what, what's the threshold for degree of belief at which you're allowed to say that you believe it? And the answer to that question is, there isn't really any one clear distinguishing number, like different contexts, different um, audiences, different intentions in mind, all lead to different, so it, maybe having a philosophical conversation, you'd be quite strict about when you say i believe like when you and Sai ten were having that conversation there was obviously the both of you were like guards up fully like not gonna and any any slip or or loose word would be pounced upon by the other person so when someone's saying do you believe this you have to like fully i don't know if i believe it i i feel quite strongly that it's true does that count kind of thing you're not like like in a philosophical conversation the degree of belief kind of means that is is in question so you're less likely to just sort of casually say that you believe it however if you're like down the pub and someone says you know some some casual uh send did you believe that such and such you might go yeah sure you know i believe that you know trump will be a disaster or something but uh, now if we tried to put like 
money on it, then maybe like you're not quite sure whether it's going to be a disaster or whether it's going to actually. That's a really terrible example. <laughs> it probably is going to be a massive disaster. But. So I think you know, and bef and before we get too far afield, because this may be a discussion for another time, I object to that entire methodology, uh, and it may be because of. Uh, the mindset with which I approach belief. But when I talk about whether or not I believe something, it's with respect to a single proposition. Are, are, you know, do you accept this proposition? And what you're talking about, about uh, degrees of belief, and, and even in the description you were using, it's between two or more possibilities. So, for example, you know, do you believe there's tea in the cup? Well, I could just say, no, I, I'm not yet convinced. This is about, am I convinced that there's tea in the cup? But when you start talking about betting on whether it's more likely that there's tea in the cup than there's coffee in the cup, now you're addressing multiple propositions. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a big issue with that, which is kind of a long conversation that we may have to sideline for a little while in order to get to the, to the precept stuff, but it yeah, would be... Sure. To correct, because when Blake and I had conversations, he was wanting to go on this, you know, degree of belief between, you know, hey, proposition A is God exists and proposition, you know, B is God does not exist. Where are you? Where are you going to put bets? And at that point, you're addressing two propositions. And yes, in that case, those are the only two, you know, either God or not God. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they need to be addressed independently. Um to say that I am convinced of a proposition necessitates that we're talking about a single proposition. Yeah, right. But the, I mean, and, and I, I am happy to move on, but l let me just point out that the, it seems kind of once you go down this route, if you have a, as a kind of like rational constraint that if you have a degree of belief, say take some proposition P um, and let's say for instance, that your degree of belief in that is 0.6. Now, it, surely it's a rational constraint, uh, at least when, if we're talking about degrees of belief, that if your degree of belief is 0 0.6 that P, then your degree of belief that not P should be 0.4. Right? You should have a corresponding degree of belief in the negation of the proposition, which is like one minus your degree of belief in the affirmation of the proposition. Otherwise, it would be weird. You, you could believe with, say, 0.6 that the proposition is true and believe with 0.6 that the proposition is not true, then sure. like that sums to more than one. And that no, seems like I, the calculus would kind of break down that, right? No, so, I absolutely agree that that's the case as long as we're talking about, you know, like P and not P. Yeah, sure. So right. you have to, so the weird thing about this degree of belief idea is that if you say that I don't have, there's no proposition that I have a degree of belief of one in, which is like you're trying to say, I'm not really certain about anything. I don't have this like, kind of certainty. Right. Belief. Then that means that you have a corresponding, at least very small degree of belief in every other, in the negation of each of those propositions. So let's say you have a, nine, a 0 0.99 uh, degree of belief that God doesn't exist, let's just say. And that means you have a corresponding 0 0.01 degree of belief that he does exist. So for every proposition, there's some tiny fraction of you, that, some tiny kind of degree of belief that you have in the negation of that proposition. Yeah, and see, when it comes to something like um, the God proposition, uh, I, I think that... I'm, I know that depending on how we structure things uh, conversationally, um, I may well believe that a particular God does not exist. I, I may have a high confidence that a particular God doesn't exist. But there are cases where the God is defined in such a way that it is ultimately unfalsifiable and that I would have to be, you know, at the 0.5 uh, type thing, which to me doesn't mean I am halfway convinced that a God exists. To me, that means I am not convinced that a God exists, and I am not convinced that this particular God doesn't exist. And which is why I've used like the jury examples and stuff like that. Well, I mean, with it being unfalsifiable, I don't think that that means that you should put your degree of belief at 0.5 just because you couldn't know the answer to it. So um, you could still have reason to think that it's very low, even though I don't. So, I mean, Russell's teapot, for instance it's you don't have a 0.5 degree of belief that there is a teapot orbiting Saturn. You, you have an almost zero degree of belief in that. You don't know that it's not true because you can't tell observationally if it is or not, but that doesn't give you any reason to think that it is true. It's just as unlikely as any other random hypothesis I pull out of thin air. 
you should, you should have quite a low degree of blur. I mean, 0.5 is quite good, actually. 0.5 is like you do have a fair, you know, a, a non negligible amount of belief towards that proposition. So I think that just the kind of random, uh, this historic kind of god plucked out of some obscure kind of tradition somewhere someone presents it to thor or something like you you should you, i don't think it's tr it's fair it's only reasonable to say that you could work well, because there's nothing i can say in either direction that i should be 0.5 you should still be quite low about that I, i'm not going to give you an exact number but i think it's below 0.5 uh, but i'd say the difference between you know russell's teapot and most of the god propositions we're talking about is that um russell's teapot addresses physical material things that we know we have information about whereas the gods are making propositions about things outside the material world that we can't investigate we can't know anything at all about that yeah you know it, it's it's like i'm i'm in the sealed box and you're talking about something outside of the sealed box compared to i'm in the sealed box and you're talking about something in the corner of the sealed box that i can't currently mm -hmm. look at i mean uh so they're different different categories of things which is where the analogies tend to break down so if if being well we'll we'll, ha we'll have to talk about <laughs> degrees of confidence um and, and dig in on that but i you and i've had these really you, you had two i think two hour conversations with matt slick in particular yeah and uh, I watched the first one on all the way through. Uh, I watched the second one. I'm about 45 minutes to an hour in, and I got busy with other things, but it's still open in my browser, ready to go back to it. <laughs> my interactions with Matt started when he called the show six, seven years ago, something like that, with his version of the transcendental argument for the existence of God, which is a presuppositionalist, but when Matt talks about it, he tries to make it not a presuppositionalist argument. He'd say, you know, atheists uh, have to presuppose the what he's calling the logical absolutes, uh, not identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. And then he says that Christians presuppose them too, but they can justify them. As if this gets him out of it being a presupposition. There, there's already in the description this incredible confusion and I thought I'd, it'd be a good idea, you know, so that I'm not the only one who's uh, uh, giving thoughts on this. If you talk about your views on presuppositional apologetics, what you've dealt with it, with Matt and others, and how it's distinct from uh, its origins with, you know, Van Til and Greg Bonson and others, uh, because Cy, Cy Tenbergengate, identifies as a presuppositionalist. I'm not convinced that Matt Slick does. As a matter of fact, I, I seem to recall him denying it. And yet we're using almost identical arguments, but there seems to be some serious confusion. As some people are better at presenting and defending a particular argument, and some people are perhaps, I, I don't want to just say they're parroting it. I think that maybe they have a flawed understanding of some portion of it, but I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Okay, well, I mean, I think it's very interesting if Matt's not identifying as a presuppositionist because I mean it, I'd always thought that he did. Um, having said that, I I had already I already had uh, suspicions that the argument presented the way that he does doesn't really classify. I mean, it does. It isn't the transcendental argument as posed as made famous by Greg Banson, who's one of Van Til's students, right? And Greg Banson is. Um, the the guy who's I suppose mo more than most other people responsible for forming that cyclone style of uh, presuppositionist that everybody knows like from the internet or whatever. There's there's various examples of people. I won't name any names, but right, you you find them, and they say things like the proof that God exists is that without God you couldn't prove anything. That type of line, which is just parroting things that Greg Banson said. Um, Matt Slick doesn't quite say things on, along those lines, but I'd always thought charitably to read what he's doing as a support for the transcendent, the actual transcendental argument. So the transcendental argument, as I see it, says something like, God is the necessary precondition for the intelligibility of, of everything, really. So it, the idea is easy. It doesn't really matter what thing you pick, whether it's the laws of logic or 
um, the smell of a rose or whatever, right? The idea is supposed to be that everything presupposes the existence of God. There's nothing that's kind of neutral that, that doesn't presuppose God. Um, so, so the first premise is that God is the necessary precondition for the intelligibility of anything. Um, and then the second premise is just whatever it, thing it is that you pick is intelligible, right? The smell of the rose um, is, is part of a kind of organized, comprehensive, like, world you can make sense out of. Um, therefore, God exists. Because you couldn't have that fact without God existing. That's what the first premise says. So, so that seems to me what the transcendental argument is. It's got this bold claim that everything presupposes God. And then the second premise just presents one of those things. And then the conclusion is that God exists. And Matt Slick doesn't do that. Um, what he does, it seems to me, is that his transcendental argument is called that because, specifically because it focuses on what he calls transcendentals, which is basically logical principles, things like the law of excluded middle, non-contradiction and that. He thinks of those things as transcendental. And so he's just saying, logic has this property um, of, of being transcendental basically and if you're an atheist you're you believe in a world where all that there is is matter and material things and there's no transcendental entities so um how could you you can't affirm atheism and have logic at the same time um and so but on the christian view you can because of christianity somehow god is like the explanation for logic i don't know maybe he's I've, he's never really i mean i've talked to, to him about this in detail and he's never really given me much of a coherent view i don't think he's worked this out the way that he thinks about it but i think broadly speaking he thinks the logical laws are parts of god's mind or something so they're divine thoughts um and that that's an ontological category that he has available to him as a christian that as an atheist read sort of reductive materialist atheist who only believes in space and time and matter or something, that they don't have that kind of ontological category available to them. So because uh, logical laws exist, but atheism can't account for logical laws, that means yeah. that atheism is false. That's that's his argument, it seems to me. And it's not quite the same as the transcendental argument. Yeah, it was it was confusing to me because his presentation to this is to present um, the laws of the laws of logic, as he calls them, uh, the, or the logical absolutes of identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. I think that uh, Russell referred to them as just the laws of thought, but I don't tend to view these as laws in a prescriptive sense. I'm not even sure that I view them as laws in a descriptive sense. I think that they are just truths that we. Uh, I, I don't have a justification for them other than that they seem to be foundational. There doesn't seem to be any way that they could be wrong. And they continually demonstrate their usefulness in and and accuracy with regard to reason. You know, the thing that I was talking about earlier with a, a simple Venn diagram. And Matt's view of this is there has to be something that guarantees that these things are always true. Mm. And that something that guarantees this must be God. Now, I'm not convinced that there has to be something that guarantees that they're always true. But even if I was, I don't know how we can get to God being that, that it's not just um, this is the way things are. I know it's it's a very unsatisfying answer to say this is the way things are. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't give you the sort of foundation you're looking for, but the foundation you're looking for is completely independent of what foundation there might actually be. Yeah. So like the, um, so the laws of logic are very, very difficult things to, um, be certain about their nature, right? They're very obscure esoteric items. They're not like bricks or pork pies or something that you can just examine and be very certain about like what type of thing they are. They're, they're very, strange so i mean yeah the idea are they prescriptive or descriptive I, I think anyone who tries to tell you that they they know the answer to that question with a high degree of certainty is um is is pretending really or they don't know what they're talking about because it's just a very difficult situation to get your head around um but so look, what one way of thinking about them is is like this that um so 
to go back to Kant for a moment, when we started off, we were saying that there, there were a priori and a, a posteriori and analytic and synthetic truths. Um, and Kant's idea was that there can be, um, there can be, um, let's see, so there can be, um, which way around is it? Damn it, now my brain's, I've been listening to uh, a Kant lecture earlier today and um, it's getting confused. But the idea is that there can be synthetic a priori truths, right, which are um, factual statements. So synthetic truths are ones that are not merely uh, products of definition, but really um, are true because of some kind of substantive fact about the way that the world is, but also can be known a priori. Um, and that, that seemed to be like crossing this divide that we, that we naturally associate these four things in, into two groups. And he's saying that actually there can be this bit in the middle. Um, and the, the examples that he gives of these um, synthetic a priori truths are not like things like, oh, the logical laws exist uh, outside of the mind and in the world in some way or another, but they're, to, they're things that sort of structure our experience. Um, so things, um, so his examples are things like space and time, causality, whatever. The, that um, the question of whether they are like that in the world has to be bracketed. But the question that can be answered is that it's true that we have to see the world in that way. So he thinks that if you were to take the notion of causality out of our experience, the, you know, the idea of things following one another in a kind of ordered sequence, if you were to take that out, what you would find immediately was that it would, it would be incomprehensible what you were left with. It would just be a, a booming bashing confusion or something, I don't know what the phrase is. Um, and that, that shows you that it's essential to our experience for there to be causality. So it's a, you can tell this a priori just by reasoning can things, but it's also a substantive fact about the way that we have to see the world. So it's an indispensable truth for me that causation is a product of the way that I see the world, regardless of whether it actually inheres into the world itself. Right. I, I have to see the world like that. So it's, it's like having rose tinted glasses on that you can't take off. Right. I don't know whether the world is in fact rose tinted, but I do know that I have to see it in such a way that it looks rose tinted to me. Right. So it's a synthetic truth, but it's one that you kind of directly apprehend. Sure. Um, but at this point, we're, we're kind of and I may get terminology wrong, but this relates to um, for me, the problem of hard solipsism, that I can't demonstrate that I'm not the only mind, uh, that I can't demonstrate that I'm not in the matrix. I have to deal with the reality I experience until somebody shows me a way. Basically, I have to wear the rose-colored glasses until somebody shows me how to take them off or how to get out of the matrix. Yeah. And what many of the presuppositionalists seem to be doing are saying the reality that you're appealing to as an atheist um, you have no way of knowing whether or not that's the ultimate reality, whether that's the ultimate absolute foundational reality. And my response to this has, has pretty consistently been, yes, you're correct. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is a problem that it has plagued philosophy and I don't see any solution to it. And what the presuppositionalists are doing is claiming that they've solved the problem of hard solipsism, that they've solved the problem of truth and certainty, that they've solved the problem of knowledge and foundations and logic. And they offer no, and, and I'm not just talking about like Matt Slick and Sai, I'm talking about, you know, having gone through and read Van Til and Bonson, they're basically claiming your the atheist, the secularist, the philosophical naturalist worldview cannot solve this, but ours can. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they would say that their worldview can resolve this and no other worldview can. And I don't see any demonstration of either of those. I don't see them demonstrating that their worldview can. And I don't see them demonstrating that no other worldview can. Um, it just seems to be, it's, it's like when Matt talked about presupposing the laws of logic, but Christians can justify them. There's an inherent contradiction there uh, that right, right. justified something. You don't have to presuppose it. Well, the, so the, there's another term that never gets even at any kind of cursory definition is presupposition. And what does it mean to presuppose something? Um, because you seem to appeal to the idea that presupposition doesn't have any justification, which, which might be right. I mean, I'm not, I'm happy to, I, I wish there was a kind of community agreed definition of presupposition. Um, but let's not, 
I mean, I, there's a worry that presupposition just ends up meaning, meaning a properly basic belief, which is a slightly different idea, it seems to me, which comes from planting yeah. there, which is that, like, it's that an agent... Well, so his idea is something like um, the, the Christian is normally sort of vilified by philosophers for having a bunch of beliefs like Christian religious beliefs that they can't provide any kind of rigorous like scientific justifications for. Like they believe in God, how stupid is that, whatever. And and Plantica quite rightly, I think, points out that, well, there actually are lots of things that um, everybody believes that they, they don't really have any kind of they can't really explain to you in a, in a decent sense why they believe that. So take one example is the existence of other minds, right? It, everything that you can tell about the world, everything you can observe is quite compatible with no one else having any conscious experience and just being sort of things that behave in such a way as if they do, right? And you couldn't, you couldn't tell like that someone has another mind, partly because we don't really know what minds are and how they're generated by the brain or anything. But it seems like nothing you can do could tell whether or not you're just um, a zombie or, or, or whether everybody else is a zombie or not. And yet we believe that other people have minds. And when we, not only that, but when you see someone who has this belief that other people have minds, even though they don't really have any, they can't provide you with a good justification for that belief, we don't think that they're irrational for holding that belief. So there are lots of beliefs that have these kind of properties and call them properly basic beliefs. Their beliefs that don't have any justifications for them and yet it's not irrational to have that type of belief and planting basically says that belief in god can be considered that type of belief it's not i mean he he goes much further than that but he's saying to at least to begin with that you should be able to put this on the table and say just like you've got properly basic beliefs so do we right um, and and okay fair enough well if a presupposition works like that then it's just a belief for which there's no justification but the agent is rational for holding it nonetheless that's fair enough, but then it seems to, um, it does fit with some of the usage of presupposition. It seems to lose some of the kind of, uh, another aspect of presupposition is, is it, it seems to be like something presupposes something else. So I, I want, so one proposition presupposes another proposition. I mean, in, in, in linguistics, there's this idea of presupposition where if you say something like, um, if I say this cup has tea in it, that sentence presupposes that this is a cup. Right? It's very obvious how that like one fact is, it's, it's a bit like entailment, right? It's almost like that fact entails this fact or something. Um, but I think when people talk about presuppositions in presuppositionalism, they, they don't mean it in that kind of linguistic sense. And they really just mean it more maybe in the properly basic belief sense that you have. But then there's this kind of something gets lost in the translation where there should be that link between two propositions for, for it to be a presupposition. So, um, well, in the case of Silicon, so first of all, I, I have in the past completely rejected the idea of properly basic beliefs, uh, which is how I ended up, I think, at foundarentism, where, you know, foundationalism w would possibly hold properly basic beliefs, but coherentism is only concerned about the experience uh, within the world is, is not actually non-contradictory. So if I... I acknowledge that I act based on the idea that I am not the only mind, but I have no way to demonstrate that I'm not the only. I think I have a pretty good argument. Like, I, I don't think that I've written every wonderful song or poem ever. I, I think those are the products of other minds. I, I think it's monumentally arrogant for me to assume that I've done oh, no, it. No, but, um, yeah. don't, no, so if you're saying that uh, you're confusing, so solipsism would be that, that all that exists is your mind on this view that other things exist than your mind. It's just they're things that don't have minds. They're robots. So those robots wrote those brilliant songs. The Mozart robot wrote all of those wonderful concertos or something. So it wasn't you that did it. It was these really talented, mindless creatures that did it themselves. And, and you see, your objection works if, if the hypothesis is you've personally, your mind is all that there is, and you've created all of those things, including the Mozart concertos. Then it would be objection to say, "Well, I'm not clever enough to think of that myself." Right? So that, that sure. that's your line of thought there. Right? I, I would say this is the distinction between hard solipsism and soft solipsism. Where hard solipsism would, in in my understanding, is that I am the only mind, and soft solipsism is I am the only mind I can be confident in. Uh, so to say that I can't distinguish between whether there are other minds or other robots, but now I think we're parsing a distinction about 
uh, a mind that may be wrong. I mean, if a robot can produce a concerto, um, how is that mind any le or how is that robot any less of a creative mind than my own? Well, so the idea is that it, um, it, it displays all of the outward behavior of a minded creature, um, but just without there being any inner kind of qualia, any um, awareness of itself, right? Like you've got, I mean, I assume, right? It's, it's easy for me talking from my point of view because I know I've got this internal life, right? That, that, you know, I really do have thoughts. I don't just seem like I have thoughts. But for maybe for you, from my point of view, you might just be a thing that looks like it's having an internal life, right? You say the right things, you, you kind of, move around and your facial expressions seem like they're betraying the fact that you've got an inner life going on but maybe you don't maybe they're just all on the outside like that's that's the view in question i'm not doubting whether or not on this it's not the same as solipsism solipsism is saying it's a doubting whether or not the external world whether or not my perceptions of the external world really correspond to anything at all and whether all there is is just me and my perceptions all right and a hard solipsism is it seems to me the claim that all there is is me and my perceptions. And soft solipsism is the claim that I can't know that right. there's anything other than me and just my perceptions. Although you, I'm now, you've, now you've brought qualia into it, and <laughs> like like Dennett, I or perhaps because of Dennett, I, I'm not convinced that qualia is a, a a real thing of any value. But <laughs> that will have to also be a conversation for another day. Um, Yes. Okay. So let's get back to uh, what you. So what you were talking about before was this the uh, the Psi Ten style presuppositionalist idea, well, the, which is a very you, the thing that both Psi and Matt have done in different ways that I don't see, except for me. You know, maybe it's an extension of of Van Til, but for example, Psi's whole thing is how do you know that? 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 This competitive yeah. kind of let's let's get you know reductivist view of exposing a problem that evidently he can't solve apart from saying he can solve it and matt slick did the same thing uh with regard to brain fizz well your brain just made you say that your brain just made you say that and i um yeah 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 okay right so i think that there's this very good analysis of the cyclone attack method there which he obviously described as is pressing the opponent for their justification for their belief how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? Right. Right. Um, so what we're doing is we're going back to that description I gave at the beginning, which is that to know something, one thinks that they have a proposition that they believe, which acts as a justification for the thing that they know. So the reason that I know P is be or the reason that um, my justification for believing that P is my belief that Q and my justification for believing Q is my belief that um, R or whatever, right? And you can go on in a chain, as we described before, there's kind of three and architectures to that. But so the tactic is to uh, is exploiting this <clears throat> this idea. And it's asking the, the interlocutor for a justification for a belief. Tell me something you know and, and why do you know it? Right? That's saying, give me a belief and give me the justification that makes it a knowledge claim rather than a belief claim. And then when you give them the justification, they say, Well, how do you know that? So provide me with a justification for this. Uh, first justification sure and by going down the rabbit hole here you'll get to a point where things become so uh, difficult to explain and uncertain that you end up thinking well I just I don't really know why I have this belief here at which point so I would then say that that shows that your worldview is incoherent and you have no explanation that you can't account for blah 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 so what's going on and, and then he'll declare victory and say that only in christianity can you have a consistent worldview or something like that right so, so it seems to be a kind of it's like a wrestling match where you're trying to pull the other guy down and once you've got them in the pinned position of them not being able to provide any justification anymore you've kind of won and you know, that that's the technique it seems to me. so what's going on here is that if you ask sai well how do you know that he'll say something like God reveals it to me in such a way that I can't be mistaken about it, right? in such a way that I know it for certain. And what he's doing there is he's not giving you a belief as a justification. He's appealing to uh, something being the case outside of his internal mind um, that makes it true that he, uh, his, like it's, it, the justification is not internal, it's external to him. And there's this split in epistemology between internalists and externalists. And internalists are people who think that justifications have to be 
mental items like beliefs. Externalists appeal to some different idea of justification. So an externalist might say something like, um, so if you say something like, look, you, you have this belief that you're, I don't know, looking at an apple or something, but why do you think that you know that that's an apple? Right? What's your justification for, for thinking that it is, in fact, a, a truthful um, belief? Um, so the externalist might say something like, well, it's true that I have reliable belief forming mechanisms, like my perception works more or less, my brain processes the information that comes through, and I'm not under the influence of any hallucinatory drugs or anything. And that's why, um, that's what justifies my uh, belief being, uh, my belief in this case. The, the justification isn't itself a belief. It's a fact about the way that the world is. That means that I've got a reliable belief forming process. And they say, but how do you know that you've got a reliable belief forming process? And you say, I don't know that, right? I'm not saying that I know that that's true. I'm just saying that it is true. And that's what just, that's what makes my belief reliable in this case, right? So it's, in, it's unsatisfying to some people to this have is, this option. This is so why I think that all of this is about their need for certainty, because when, when they're basically casting aspersions and doubts upon this and saying, well, how do you know that? How do you know your thoughts are reliable? What they seem to be saying, at least in my mind, is how can you be certain of this? Because when, when somebody says, how do you know that? What I when I say, how do you know that? What I mean is, why are you confident? I'm not, I don't care about certainty. I don't think you can get there. Why are you confident that this is the case? And they continue this parade of how do you know in response as if someone has claimed certainty. And if you throw any doubt on that or any shade on this, that the whole thing falls apart. But when I talk about, you know, what I believe in, and I don't really talk about things in terms of, of knowing it because there's so many problems with it, but I can talk about confidence levels. And I would say, you know, well, how do you know that your experience is reliable? Ah, to me, that question means what is the justification for you trusting your experiences? And on that front, that it, it is, you know, this has consistently been um, reliable in the past. It, I can test the results of anything and my confidence level in it, in any particular belief. I mean, I'm going back to, to Hume, of course, where the wise man apportions his belief to the evidence. Uh, that's him talking about a confidence level. How, how reliable is the evidence and my ability to process it? Uh, I can only, I, the only standard I can judge it by is the results that it seems to consistently produce. And I'm never absolutely certain. And I am always, uh, all, all of my positions in, in much of the way that we would see in science are tentative conclusions subject to revision upon more information. And when they say, well, how do you know that? I just get to the point where, where I have to say, look, based on what you seem to be implying by knowledge, which is some sort of certainty, uh, I would say I don't know it. I just have what I think is a reasonable belief, and I can explain why it's reasonable. But that's never going to be satisfactory, and that's why I think that what they're that there's a hidden certainty in everything that you know, like for example, Matt and Sy are saying. I don't know if that qualifies for for Van Til and Bonson as well. Well, I, I, I think that the, the, um, the sleight of hand with the presuppositionalist is that he demands an internalist account of justification for you, because you have to tell him in each case what it is that justifies every belief down the chain until you get to a point where you don't know how to proceed. But if you ask him about his justification, he provides an externalist account of the justification. Right, it's true because God makes him know it. Right? He doesn't have a justification, an internal justification for that belief. And in, in re you think about it, he couldn't do. An in internalist can't achieve um, certainty in the sense that they're asking for. If, like, so, okay, so just run through the situation. Imagine the presuppositionalist sticks to the criteria that they try and hoist upon you. Um, i.e. They, they provide justification for their beliefs that are internal to them. And so they, you say, well, how, how do you know that the world exists? And they say something like, well, God tells me in such a way that I can't be certain. If you then say, 
how do you know that God's told you? That's what that I did. In such a way that you can't be certain. They can't, I mean, if they appeal to the fact, well, God told me that, he told me that I can't be certain, I can't be wrong about it. You say, well, how do you know that? All they can do is appeal to God telling them that, they told them that, they told them that. Yeah, and, I don't know how to escape this internalist thing. This is one of the things that yeah. I read with Sai is that you think that human reasoning is necessarily flawed, and so I described it as like a dirty filter, and it doesn't matter if there is a God pouring clean water through the dirty filter, it's still going to come out dirty. That was the example that I used. Right, he, right. On the internalist picture, that's right. Yeah, definitely. But I don't know what the justification is for to, to escape the internalist view, because anything that would be external can always be contained in this loop of my internalist view. I don't know how to escape that. And when they, every assertion they make, oh, well, God reveals it to me in such a way. Well, I, what you're really saying is you are convinced that God has revealed it to you in such a way, but I don't know how you can possibly justify that there was an externalist God as opposed to you just thinking that there was an yeah, external. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it's an externalist justification, the externalist account of justification, um, differs quite a lot from the internalist account. So you know, by definition, the whole point of externalism is that the justification isn't something, it's not a belief, it's a fact, the external feature of reality. So the, the normal type of externalism away from presuppositional apologetics, where you'd say something like, you'd give like a kind of causal story about light bouncing off the object and hitting my eye and then my eye processing it and you know, that, that's the belief forming mechanism that you're appealing to. That's why your belief is, is counts as knowledge. You believe it, there's a reliable belief forming mechanism underneath it, and it's true. So that, that means it's knowledge. Now, the thing is that you don't know whether or not the justification bit of the equation is there or not. But like you know that you believe it, like you're internally aware of your own belief in the proposition, but you're not internal, you don't have any internal access to the to the um, the actuality of the uh, causal story that I just gave, right? It just it just has to be there in order for what you your belief to be true. You don't know whether or not it is there, but the point is you're just saying. So 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 the idea is if when you get to a if you can tell a uh, a causal story an otherwise plausible externalist story about what it, what happened to bring about your belief um, and and. Normally, it's something to do with like the reliability of whatever mechanism it is that's posed. Um, and then the presuppositionalist is doing the same thing. They're saying, there's this story I can tell about how there's this like really reliable um, process that happened. A perfect God, gave, a perfect all-loving God gave me this belief. And that's a reliable belief-forming process because a perfect God would, would never mislead you. Right? So it's, if that story is true, that's an externalist justification. The only problem is, if, if they're allowed to do that, then you're allowed to say, okay, well, I've got this causal story. And the reason that I know that the world exists is because, you know, light bounces off objects, goes into my eyes, gets processed by my brain, and blah, blah, blah. And that's reliable belief forming process. So that, that's me. You know, if that story is true, then the external world exists. If that's sure. what justifies my belief, then my belief is, in fact, knowledge. So I, I don't just think that objects are in front of me. I know that they are. And the justification is they're actually interacting with me, causing me to have these beliefs in a reliable manner. So if, I, if they're allowed to have an externalist story to tell, then I'm allowed to have an internalist story to tell. And I don't have to know that it's true, just like they don't know, in fact, that their externalist story is true. They're just saying, I've got this idea, it's been put into my brain, and if it's true that that was put into my brain by a god, then that would count as justification. That's what an externalist does. And it's improper to ask them to provide... Uh, an internalist idea of justification for that, because that's externalism. So externalism is kind of awkward for many ways anyway, right? It's not necessarily well, that's, brilliant. That's because, the thing that's confusing to me, because every description of externalism that I've ever heard, including what you were just talking about, um, still could be viewed as just an internalist view making an assertion. There's no, there's no way to access. Yeah, 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 right, right. So you're saying from the internalist perspective, the externalist seems like he's just changing the subject or begging the question or something. But really what's going on is that the externalist is saying, I don't, you, your standard of justification, what you think justification is, is wrong. Right? You think justification is a belief. Justification isn't like that. It's a different type of thing. 
it's like a reliable some kind of mechanism that produces true beliefs more often than not or something but they and have that no way to demonstrate that the thing that they're appealing to externally is real that yeah that's right that's right an assumption if in fact there was a god who was perfect and who could serve as a foundation for reason or could somehow warrant give warrant to my uh, or a justification to my views then i would have a justified view but that there's this big if then for this externalist justification and i think it applies whether you're talking about a god or whatever which is why i have issues uh w with this particular model although i know ozzy's an externalist i don't know if you are or not um i'm not um <laughs> i i i wouldn't like to self-identify as either of those i find i find this matter very confusing i but i mean this is slightly another kind of pet peeve of mine but i don't generally self-identify with philosophical positions at all well then you and i are in the same boat because uh, i struggled for years and bounced around and and you know learned more and reformed things and when i say that when it comes to epistemology i'm largely in agreement with susan hawk's found herentism which is this combination of foundationalism coherentism it's because that's the combination that has made the most sense and resonates best with my thing yeah uh and I, while I'm not uh, an externalist because I don't see the, the justification for merely asserting that there is something external that I, I, I don't see how to escape this issue of it yeah. ultimately being just an assertion. I'm also not an internalist because I, for the same reason, uh, I don't identify as a philosophical naturalist at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a methodological naturalist. I'm not going to make a claim about whether or not something beyond nature exists unless I have a good reason for it. Uh, and the mere fact that I don't have access to it or can't explore it that isn't enough for me to conclude that it doesn't exist. Instead, it seems much more reasonable to me to say whether or not something beyond the natural world exists, I am experiencing the natural world. I have to operate within the bounds of the of the you know the the what I experience in the rules. And as long as that is internally you know, coherent as long as my methods for discovering this reality, whether it's a matrix or whatever, um, continue to produce viable results. It would be bizarre for me to act as if the world I experience isn't real. And it would, it, you know, all the evidence points to the conclusion that I would be dead if I acted as if the world I experience isn't real. And this doesn't seem to be a problem um, for religious believers at all. Because on some level, the world that we experience, uh, no matter how real it is, it isn't the ultimate reality. And so dying here means you're moving on to an ultimate reality. And, and so when they make this assertion, and I, I want to end on, on this point of, of strategically how to engage with presuppositionalists. Whether you're doing, you're getting the, oh, your brain made you say that, uh, or how do you know that, this parade along those lines. I think you've been pretty clear on it, but I wonder if you could just kind of sum up what you think um, the best response is to the presuppositionalists. Because when I what I hear them say is, my worldview solves a problem that no other worldview can. And I don't see any demonstration that this is anything more than a bald assertion that, you know, if this is the case, then this, how do we, what's, what do you think is the best way to shut that down or expose that you're on no better footing than anybody else? So stop pretending that you are. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So I think, well, one th I mean, I, uh, there's, there's no real substitute for um, reading philosophy in, in sort of doing the homework because that doing philosophy teaches you by uh, sort of like the way that when you join the military, they break you down like in the first couple of weeks or something until you, you know, you've kind of lost your own um, sense of self or something. I am like, now a board of the state and will do whatever I'm told. Yeah, I, w I was in the Navy for eight years and I remember boot camp. Uh, right. 
funly, but also a little strangely. <laughs> okay, good. So when you, um, I think there's a kind of boot camp mentality when you start doing philosophy, which is that it kind of breaks down your uh, comfy little ideas that you had about the ways that things are, and you suddenly start to feel like the things that you always took for granted and that maybe there's reason to doubt them, read some very convincing arguments against what you've cherished and believed the whole time. Um, and then what happens is that you suddenly oscillate between different people's views. Um, so you'll read someone one week and believe everything they say. And, you know, you read Kant one week and believe everything Kant said is, is right. Then you read like Hegel the next week and you realize that Hegel has this like crushing critique of Kant. And that now you believe everything Hegel says. Um, and, and But then you read, I don't know, Heidegger's response to Hegel. And somehow Hegel seems really naive and childish and you're suddenly a Heideggerian or whatever. Right. So, so. Yeah. It reminds me. There's a, a scene in Goodwill Hunting where he marches in and oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> owns this guy on you know <laughs> economics, but it's also so I have no expertise in anything. I'm entirely self-taught, and I went through uh, after I found my way out of religion. I went through and I read a number of philosophers' views, and after and I don't remember how many, and I I but I didn't bounce from oh, now this person's convinced me to now this person's convinced me to, you know, what yeah, happened? I may have been exaggerating somewhat. <laughs> what happened for me is, uh, for right or wrong, Hume pretty much solved all of my concerns about epistemology. And as I went out and read others, um, you know, it's not that Hume was perfect. I would find little things. But I mean, as far as like the core of it, when people who aren't interested in reading everything that every philosopher has ever written uh, email me, and I'm like, just go read Hume. <laughs> you will at least not be incredibly sucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I mean, Hume's a very special case as well because he's uh, he's kind of accessible. Uh, it's not overly terminological. I mean, there's it is kind of it's old worldy kind of language i suppose but it's it's readable by by a non-professional philosopher um the, the thing is though that then the next guy in the chain is kant after hume if you read hume and you like hume and possibly the reason that you stuck on hume was that you didn't immediately go and do a long course on kant because any decent course on kant will show you um it, it would have made you realize that there's a lot of things that hume got wrong and that kant kind of sorts out a lot of the problems that he poses and generates his own kind of dialectical waves that follow on in his wake. I um, actually so, disagreed with Kant on, many, <laughs> but we'll have to save that for another time. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let me, so let me go back to your question in the first place, which was, uh, um, beat the precepts. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So I suppose, um, one, so one way of thinking about it is like this, that there's if the typical precept question, so Cy ten Bruggenkate version of it anyway, which is the, like, I don't know, something like, I think he says something like, how do you know you're not like, in fact, what is it? Something like in a bed in a, in a hospital dreaming like this whole thing right now, right? You could be just dreaming yeah, everything. Delusions. It's yeah. kind of his take on, you know, how do you know you're not stuck in the matrix? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So I think the best response to that type of, of move is to sort of double down um, because what he's, I mean, I think that you can launch a quite an interesting transcendental argument um, in reverse on, on that question, right? So this is what I was trying to find earlier. There's this bit of um, a book by Wittgenstein, who's another one of these philosophers that once you end up reading him, you think everyone before him is wrong. Um, so it's this book by Wittgenstein it's called On Certainty, which is the last thing that he wrote. Never really published it, I think, but this is a collection of sort of notes um, right up until like a few weeks before he died, I think, the last bits of it. Anyway, there's this one proposition in there, because he just writes kind of aphorisms, or whatever, propos numbered propositions. But, so I'm, I just want to read this, it's very, very short. Um, so this is number 383 in Uncertainty. Um, and it says, the argument I may be dreaming is senseless for this reason. If I am dreaming, this remark is being dreamed as well. And indeed, it's also being dreamed that these words have any meaning. Right? And I think in that, there's, it's kind of a short, pithy-ish um, uh, idea there. But to, so to flesh it out, the idea is that, well, when you're dreaming, like for instance, I had a dream a little while ago where I was, I, I was reading a newspaper, right? But 
upon waking, I realized that, um, you know, I was trying to think what was a newspaper article about? And I, I realized that like, actually it was just kind of shapes and like blurred, like colors and stuff on, on the paper. But it felt to me like I was reading a newspaper in the dream. I didn't think oh, I'm just looking at meaningless shapes. I, my dream included within it the experience of understanding concepts and words when in actual fact I wasn't doing that. And so dreams can have, like if I'm dreaming, along with also thinking that all of my perceptions might be misleading, right? I might not be really sitting here in my house talking to you, all these perceptions I'm having, but also you should doubt the meaning that you're comprehending the meanings of words correctly as well. Like in my case where I think I'm reading the newspaper, but actually I'm not. Um, and so if somebody says to you, like, how do you know that you're not dreaming? Part of what he's asking you to do is to accept that, that when he says that to you, that those words, that you do in fact understand that those, those words correctly. And that means to not, you know, because if I'm dreaming, then it's like the person who's just posed this challenge to me might have just said an unintelligible string of sounds that I think constitutes a challenge some epistemic challenge to give my justification, right? But if I'm dreaming that that's true, I'm not actually under any obligation to provide any epistemic justification. So I'm only under any obligation to answer that question on the hypothesis that I do in fact understand his words properly. But that means I'm bracketing out some part of what might be a dream and I'm just saying, well, that's true, right? So, it, so the question isn't really, how do you know that everything isn't a dream? The question is saying, how do you know that everything apart from the, my words that I'm telling you now aren't the dream? And the answer is, well, I mean, if I'm allowed to help myself to the kind of true bare, bare reality of like me understanding what you're saying, and I, to me it seems like that's already presupposing that I'm not dreaming because I can only have that kind of, if I, if I know that I'm not dreaming what you're saying to me, then in actual fact, there is somebody standing here in front of me who's really asking me a question and I'm awake and listening to him saying it. And I must be awake if I'm comprehending it properly. And if I am, and if all of those things are true, then that just means that I'm not dreaming, right? So it's kind of like the, it's a presupposition of me being able to, or it's a precondition of his words being intelligible that I'm in fact awake and hearing somebody for real asking me a question. And if that wasn't true, then I, I, I can't really, I don't really feel like I'm under any obligation to answer his question. Like the skepticism to which I should apply to the external world, I should also apply to the meaningfulness of his question. And if I do that, I should doubt that it's a meaningful question, just as I doubt whether or not the external world exists. And I, I can't just pick and choose. So the idea is that if you really are asking me that question, then I'm awake. That's essentially the answer. <laughs> and it's, it's a transcendental argument because you're saying the meaningfulness of your question presupposes that I'm awake and I'm proving it by saying if you assume the opposite, if you assume the contrary, that I'm in fact dreaming, then your question becomes impossible. So not only is it a transcendental argument, but it proceeds by impossibility of the contrary. Right? So it's exactly the Psi 10 methodology that's being employed, but it's just a better, you know, it's like the, I'm, I'm presupping the, the question, I suppose. I think that's my best response. And, and I like that, but I immediately see a problem. Okay, good. Um, and that is, is it possible for me in a dream to have another actor in my dream, a fictional construct in my dream, look at me and say, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Yeah, of course, that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. But if you're, so, I mean, it's like saying, if I'm dreaming, so sometimes maybe if I'm dreaming, I'm like also walking around the house, right? And I'm sleepwalking. And maybe I, um, I pick up a glass and I take a drink from it whilst I'm asleep, sleepwalking. And in my dream, I, I'm dreaming that I just picked up a glass. And maybe for some reason in my dream, I dream that I'm in the room in my house where I'm picking up a glass and taking a drink. So yeah, sometimes in dreams, it can actually correspond to reality in the same way that perceptions do when you're awake. So it could be, when you, when you have a perception in a dream that it's true, right? There could be, in fact, like in, in Total Recall, that guy comes in and, and tells him that he's actually having a dream and he needs to take the pill or whatever, and it's like, am I, is this guy being beamed in or whatever? Yeah, okay. Um, but the point is that if you're being um, skeptical, um, so, so the question would be rather, is there any reason to think that this given instance of someone who claims to be yes. a messenger, right, is, should I think that, that he is in fact 
that. And then the idea would be that you don't, you, you can't tell whether he is or he isn't. I seem so to be skeptical we're, towards that. We're, not, not to champion my, my own uh, view on this, but we're right back to, to the conclusion that I came to some time ago. That is, um, I cannot demonstrate, uh, and it may be impossible to demonstrate. And I'm, while I'm not, I won't say I'm comfortable with the idea that it might be impossible. Um, I'm stuck dealing with the reality that I experience until somebody shows me some way out. And so if I'm in a conversation with somebody says, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Um, I think my response is, are you asking me if I'm certain that I'm not <laughs> dreaming right now? Or are you just asking me why I think I'm not dreaming right now? And well, sir, I, think, I think my, my response is stronger than that, right? I'm saying, um, if, you, if I was dreaming, um, then your question would be meaningless, or I should at least doubt the meaningfulness of your question. So to the extent that you want me to take you seriously is also the extent to which it, I have to presuppose that I'm actually awake hearing a real question. So I do have a fairly strong response there. It's not just, well, I, you know, I have to deal with my own reality. It's like, I, it seems to me it makes no sense. Your question makes no sense unless I am in fact awake. I mean, it calls more into question than... Like it, it, what it seems to it, the question is like I just want that the skeptic is like I want to just call into question your perceptions, but I want to keep a large feel like basically linguistic meaning. I don't want to call that into question, right? But then that's like a kind of selective skeptic or something. But really, the dreaming hypothesis is isn't selective. It's kind of global, right? It's like everything. We're dreaming everything. Like I said, you can dream that things are meaningful or not. So the real dreaming hypothesis is kind of self-refuting. If, I mean, the, the extent to which you take it seriously is also the extent to which you have to be awake. So you, you, you can sort of think about it casually, but if you really entertain the hypothesis, it, it's not meaningful unless you're awake, in which so case it's false. Let, let's imagine my objection. I'm, I'm dreaming, and in my dream, somebody says to, you, to me, how do you know you're not dreaming now, which we've agreed is something that could happen in a dream. Yeah. By the individual asking me the question, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Um, if it happens in a dream, and I'm acknowledging that it can happen in a dream, then all I'm really saying is, for now, the dream is as real to me as any other thing until I have some reason to find a way to escape it. I, I, that's, not, that's, not, that's not clear enough. But it's more like if somebody appears to ask you a question in a dream, then A, you're not really under any obligation to answer it because it's a dream, do what you like. B, okay. you have no real reason to think that it's meaningful, that you've really even been asked a question. It might just have seemed to you like, you were asked a question, but in actual fact, it was just your brain making you feel like something meaningful had happened when nothing meaningful had happened. Okay. Right. Um, for it to actually be a real question that you actually are under any obligation to answer, seems to me it presupposes that you're awake at sure. least, that, amongst many other things. Right. It that presupposes is a, that the person I skipped over is whether or not there's any. Well, you you phrase it as obligation to answer, but w whether or not this is an issue of concern because if i'm in a dream yeah. and says are you dreaming it's of no concern to me that this individual has said that uh because it doesn't in any way impact whether or not i'm dreaming exactly so that's why i'm saying to the extent to which you take the question seriously is the extent to which you have to assume that you're awake and really being asked the question that you should worry about so and it seems the uh the nutshell answer is we shouldn't take presupposition with seriously well, we should, certainly shouldn't take these types of presuppositions seriously because it's just a game. It's a, it's a way of uh, hustling the unsuspecting, the kind of uh, interested um, amateur philosophy enthusiast who um, will be tripped up because he's trying to answer questions honestly. So uh, let, me ask, let me ask you this as the closing kind of remark. And, and I realize that you know, you're not a mind reader any more than I am. For we, I've had disagreements and debates with many of my friends about what do apologists really believe? Like there are people who say, oh, you know, this particular apologist doesn't actually believe this. And my interactions with most of them is, you know, I have no reason to not take them at their word. But if this is a game, 
um, with a goal of tripping up, you know, sort of armchair amateur philosophers. Do you think that Matt and Cy are viewing this as a game uh, with the intent of doing that? Or do you think that they actually believe this and have some confusion they haven't recognized? Well, I mean, uh, so I, I, I kind of want to distinguish between Matt Slick on one hand and other people who I'm much more willing to say I think are just um, like trolling, essentially. They're just trying. They, they don't really care about philosophy. They're, they're not interested in this, in actual argumentation and, and really presenting things genuinely. They're just trying to win the argument, look good. Uh, they've seen other people do it. They want to emulate that. And it is a game. It's a macho game. I mean, I think Freud would say that there's always an, an element of of um, penis measuring in all philosophy. Sure. Right? That's, that's all that's going on. But it seems very close to the surface with that type of presuppositionism. Um, but the question when it comes to Matt, um, I, I I feel reluctant to say that he's like like that. And I don't think, I mean, there's a lot of bravado and it's like street fighting on the Bible thumping wingnut with when the atheists come on and there's a lot of like, um, it's combat. I mean, that's quite like why I enjoy watching it sometimes is because it's sort of, the entertainment is in the fights. Um, but I don't think that that means that he doesn't have a genuine belief. Um, I think, I mean, I think he has a genuine Christian belief. I think he also has a genuine belief for rightly or wrongly that, that he's got a good argument. I think that he believes that. I don't think he's like misleading you. I think there are people on the internet who would mislead you knowing that the argument's rubbish and, that, and not caring whether the argument's rubbish or not, but just thinking that you won't know what to say if they say this and they'll just do it anyway. And that's kind of irresponsible. I think Matt, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily get that feeling from him. Although other people do and they tell me that, that I'm way too charitable to him and that I should well, be. I, I, tend to, I tend to agree, and, and I, I think that Matt's sincere, and I don't dislike him. But one of the things that I've seen is, you know, in conversation with you, he, he'll acknowledge, you know, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a logician, I might get some of this wrong, you know, all this. There's, there's a little more humility in that, and yet he'll get up on stage in debate and talk about how terrible atheists are at logic. Yeah. And how he's an expert. He's even started like a Patreon where he's going to be teaching logic. I mean, yeah. I don't, I have my own Patreon. We're, we're looking at it now. And it's about, you know, what my thoughts are on certain things. I would never create a Patreon that says, I'm going to start teaching logic. I mean, even yeah. if, I, you know, like I just went through somebody else's textbook, you know, and was, was showing the stuff. That's, it's, it's strange to me. And when, when I, you know, repeatedly point out fallacies and there was a discussion on bible thumping wingnut between the two of us where i kind of hyperbolically said i think there were like 14 or 16 fallacies in the in those yeah. last four or five sentences uh th that's an exaggeration but there were fallacies um i i you know i don't th this the purpose of this isn't to you know bag on matt or si or anybody else uh, but I hear a lot of people saying, oh, they can't really believe the things they say. This is just a game. And when I interact with them, I find that uh, I have no reason to think that they're not genuine about their belief in a God, in the Christian God. And the confusion comes when I think they have a genuine belief that they have an argument that cannot be defeated, but they seem to lose track of the idea that the, the fact that an argument can't be defeated doesn't mean that it demonstrates that you're actually correct. It could just be a bald assertion that I cannot falsify. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, just, it depends. I mean, if the argument, there's, there's questions about what the argument is in the first place. And I, I have just uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, had a second conversation with a presuppositionist uh, guy. I think I can call him my friend. I think I'm friends with Jimmy. So Jimmy Stevens is a um, presup guy who's quite young. I think he's only like 22 or something, but very bright, very intelligent, read a decent amount of philosophy, fully into the presup world. Uh, 
and I, t I don't doubt his sincerity for a minute, right? I think he thinks he's got an argument. Um, it's just when he tries to explain it to me, I find it unintelligible what he says. And we've talked about it for hours and hours. And he finds my objections to what he says unintelligible. And it's like, there is, I think, some um, quite kind of deep uh, disagreement. And so this, it's, it's a bit like, so there's a philosophical position called dialetheism, which is the, the view that there are true contradictions, right? So if someone is a dialetheist, they're effectively denying that the law of non-contradiction is, is, is a general principle. And now it's quite difficult to argue about that because normally when, when arguing, what somebody does is they'll take the opponent's view and try and derive a contradiction from it. But that doesn't count as a refutation of the dialetheist because that is in fact his claim. So like the main kind of rational procedure for uh, arguing is, is exactly what they're calling into question. So you can't employ that as a, as a tool. And I think there's something going on with the genuine presupposition list, like not one that's just employing some kind of, you know, like Psi 10 kind of argument that seems like it's, it's just trolling or something like Matt where it's not really presuppositionalism. The actual presuppositionalist is, is, is arguing from premises that are so different from, you know, our sort of normal collective familiar starting points. Um, I mean, they call into question the idea that you can think without God, like, I think autonomously, they call it autonomous thought, right? But they call that into question. So when you say, well, look, maybe God doesn't exist. Well, what's the argument that he does? They'll say you're presupposing autonomy. Right. It's like, well, of course I'm presupposing autonomy because like, that's the basic starting point of like everything. And I say, yeah, but that's what I'm calling into question. And so it seems like it, there's almost no shared area that we can actually have a conversation about because we don't really have any concepts in common. And that, I think that's really good. The best you get out of presuppositionalists is it's like talking to someone whose language by chance has all the same words in it as you do, but they just mean completely different things. It seems like you're having a conversation conversation actually you're just you just don't know what the other person is saying you, you you think they're saying unintelligible things and they think you're saying unintelligible things um and unless there's some way of breaking that that divide i don't know if there's any uh, yeah i don't see how you can get through trying to, trying to find the resolution to this uh, isn't just tied to presuppositionalists um you know blake came over here sat on the couch behind me we had this big long conversation and i was talking about how you could actually demonstrate certain things you know like mm -hmm. We're, we're stuck in this room and there's someone outside of this room who's telepathic and telekinetic. And he did a really good job of talking about how, you know, things in the room would move and he would be getting thoughts in his mind from outside of here that would, you know, uh, that would tie to these things moving. So we would have some sort of empirical justification for thinking that there is likely to be some connection outside of this room. And when, and I thought it was a great answer. And then when I said, okay, this is analogous to what you're claiming with regard to a God that exists, you know, outside of space and time and can't interfere. Why is it that you want this, uh, this warrant for the telepathic, telekinetic psychic outside of the room and you give me good examples and yet for the God issue, you can do no such thing. And instead, when we start talking about God, you just say, well, you know, it's, it's either self-evident or you can't reason without it. There's a disconnect. And I don't, I don't think it's just linguistically. I, I think that, that one of the things that religion has done is provided people with um, such a confidence level that it becomes a bias that has a protective mechanism such that when you say, ah, you're engaged in special pleading for your God, as opposed to the sort of evidentiary warrant that you would want in some other situation. The answer is, yes, I am, but it's justified in the same way that the presuppositionalist might say that there's a difference between something that's viciously circular and virtuously circular, even though that, as far as I'm concerned, is a, a fictional distinction that they've manufactured, that no, no such warranted distinction exists. But yeah, well, I mean, they didn't make up the term virtuous circle. Uh, it's, it's a term in hermeneutics. But yeah, yeah, it's not. It's dubious whether it's employed in, the, in that way. I mean, yeah, if there's a if, if circular reasoning is what's been going on, then it does, it's it's circular whether or not you call it vicious or, or virtuous. That's right. true. And on that note, I want to 
Thank you for today. Hopefully we get to do this more and dig in on many of the areas where I might disagree. But before we go, tell everybody how they can find you, your YouTube channel, you know, contact you, et cetera, because I know um, there are people who are interested in that. Okay. I mean, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's just my name, Alex Malpass. Um, and I have a blog called The Use of Reason, where uh, I go into a bit more detail about these types of things. It's just about this type of stuff, really. So if you are interested in, in presuppositionalism, and philosophy, I suppose you might find, you might at least find the links in my articles interesting, <laughs> whether or not you like my articles themselves. Well, thanks again for doing this. I'm, I'm really hopeful that we get to do it again. And maybe we can drag Ozzy in it, because if I'm going to get an education, um, it might be interesting to see two experts with potentially different views working to correct each other as they correct me. So. Yeah, well, it's winter in Canada, so he'll be around for a while, I should think. We could probably do that. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Thanks much. Yeah, nice to see you. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.